Powerplay Chess, brought to you in association with Kagi. After five rounds of the candidates tournament, two players shared the lead. Domaraju Gukesh and Yanya Pomnishi, both on five out of eight. Just a half a point behind them. Pragnananda and Hikaru Nakamura, both on four and a half. So Nakamura has suddenly come into contention after that crushing victory against Fabiano Caruana. And I'd like to look at Hikaru Nakamura's game from today. He played black against Vidit Gujarati. Now Vidit having a real up and down tournament. He went into this game on three and a half out of eight. But he did defeat Hikaru in the first half of the tournament um, with black. So this time he's got white. Let's have a look what happened. e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4. So once again, a Jocko Piano. Knight f6 from Nakamura. d3. Now yesterday we saw Gukesh play a6 and h6 with success uh, against Vidit. Um, and Hikaru had obviously decided, well, okay, let's try and unsettle Vidit again. And he didn't play a6, but he played h6. Now, yesterday I said there is a special place in hell for players that play these little pawn moves at the side of the board. And of course, loads of people on the comments are saying, oh, well, maybe it's not so bad to play these little edge moves. I sensed when Hikaru played this that he thought, this is my time. He's come back into the tournament and Vidit is kind of rocking. You know, Hikaru really wanted to go for it in this game. No, no bishop c5 here. But instead, g5 from Nakamura. So a very direct attempt to get things going on the king's side. Fascinating. This is not unknown. It's very risky, but it's it's not unknown. Um, Shakriya Mamadyarov, for example, has specialised in playing h6 and g5. But there is... I mean, it, it, sometimes it's very interesting to storm these pawns forward, the g and h pawns, and try and get an attack. Sometimes black is just trying to put a knight on that wonderful outpost on f4. The drawback is that it does weaken these squares. And in general, if things go wrong, then black's king can be rather exposed if it ends up on the king side. So it's very double-edged. So Hikaru is really going for it with these moves. Bishop b3, the bishop drops back before it gets possibly taken by the knight. a5. So sometimes it might be possible to advance. We don't know. But anyway, um, Vidit decided, OK, I'm just going to put a stop to that one. And Nakamura castled. Now, one always has to take care of this move. So, for example, rookie one, which is a very plausible move to bounce the knight round here. That would be met by g4, and suddenly the knight only has one square. And then knight takes e4, and this is the problem. Black has won a pawn. So, white has to be very switched on here. Knight c4. And, of course... Vidit knows very well after yesterday when he got badly caught out um, on position, but also on time as well. And against Nakamura, of course, that's incredibly dangerous. So Vidit was playing relatively quickly. Knight c4. Now, I like knight c4 because it means that sometimes that knight can bounce around looking at that weakened square. In such positions, you want to put the pawn back on g6 to cover the f5 square. So that's a nice move. And if g4, then of course the knight can just come around here. And that's a bit loose now. 
like us to be really careful about advancing pawns in front of the king. So Nakamura played bishop e6. Okay, sound development, and it it uh, neutralizes the bishop on b3. Now rook e1 is possible. And that knight can always go around to d2 and bounce around to f1. Rook e8. So this is an important move in order potentially to protect the, the e-pawn, and black might want to break with d5, typical of these kind of Joko Piano positions. h3. Okay, Vidit wants a little bit of security. He doesn't want to have to always think about g4, and if g4 comes, that'll just be exchanged off. Queen d7. The sack, usually no good at all, because the knight will just come to h2. But still, queen d7 is fine. It's not really about sacrificing, not certainly not in this position. It's about just connecting the rooks. Now, both sides in this kind of pawn structure are vying for either d5 or d4 to try and get the initiative. If white tries it here, we can see now the strength of the rook on e8. There'll be an exchange and then the pawn on e4 is lost. But white is always looking at that move. Likewise, black is also looking at d5. At the moment, that's just not possible. But watch out for that. Bishop d2, rook d8, queen c2. Just connecting the rooks and means this bishop is still protected by the queen. And Nakamura played b6. I mean, this is it's a kind of waiting move. Both players are playing a waiting game here. Bishop a2. I mean, the move I would like to play with black is knight e3, looking at that beautiful f5 square. If that knight lands on f5, white's in clover. That's wonderful. But here, d5. And black's pieces are set up beautifully. You can see, for example, after this, this is securely protected. The rook and queen are lined up. That's a weak pawn on d3. So black has a huge advantage there. So white has to be careful when playing this move. So Vidit just waited with bishop a2. And Nakamura had quite a big think here. He spent 26 minutes over knight h5. He could just go for g4. Um, it's, it's hard for white to exploit the weaknesses on the king side, and the knight is quite active. But knight h5 played, perhaps looking to get in here, which could potentially be dangerous. But now knight e3, and d5, of course, isn't possible, so that knight looking pretty good on e3, looking at the two outposts on f5 and d5. So Nakamura exchanged on a2. Okay, the rook is a, just offside for just a moment. Knight e7, an important move to cover both those squares. And Vidit decided to break with d4. I mean, lots of interesting moves here. Um, I mean, d5 is even possible, but takes here, takes back. The pawns look nice, but d5. And, and I think that Nakamura sensed maybe this was the right moment to break open the middle with that rook on a2, which looks you know very strange indeed. When the position opens up, you can see that black's rook's beautifully connected, not so white's rooks. So Vidic kept things closed with e5, so that blocks out this bishop. And I have to say, I quite like white's position now. Rook c8 played, so Nakamura is looking to break with c5 and, and undermine the support for the e5 pawn. And knight g4 looks like quite a nice move for white here, which starts to get things going on, on the king's side. But Vidit played rook a3. I can well understand why he made that move. Rook a3 is a very natural response when the rook is stuck on a2. You simply want to bring that rook into the game. c5 from Nakamura. 
And once again, knight g4 is quite dangerous. But Vidit was prudent. He also, also wasn't thinking too long. You know, he was very, very well aware how dangerous Nakamura is in positions when his opponent is short of time. Rook takes c5. Well, the machines believe that knight to f4 is the best move here, and it's a very subtle move, but the idea is that black waits to recapture on c5. In some positions, it's good to take with the rook, and in others, it's good to take with the b pawn. But that is very hard to divine. Okay, rook c5 played, also not bad, and then knight f4. I mean, this is just a very human way of playing, basically. b4. And Vidit has something here. You know, white's pieces are looking pretty good. Probably best for black just to exchange here. Although, you know, this, this isn't a very pretty position. Um, for example, after this, queen b1 is a nice move. Do you see how the queen protects the f5 square? That is the key square in the entire position. That's the weak square. If white can land a knight there, then black will start to regret pushing the pawn to g5 way back on what which move was it? Move six. There we are. So the rook came back here. So Nakamura gives up that a pawn, but he's hoping to stir up trouble with an active knight. This knight coming to the game, and perhaps d4 is coming too, and this pawn is vulnerable. Bishop c3. There's no doubt that um, Vidit with white is doing well here. At the moment he's a pawn up, Nakamura decides to take that pawn back, but it's a mistake. Watch what happens. Bishop takes knight, and more tactics. At the moment material is level. But Vidit fairly quickly snapped off that d-pawn. So the whole point is it unmasks the rook, which is hitting that bishop on e5. So, for example, queen takes and knight takes e5 and white is a pawn up, a very healthy pawn up supported by that rook in the end game. Nakamura decided instead to take the knight with the knight. So knight takes bishop, Vidit gets the piece back, so now he's one pawn up and that's a very healthy pawn supported by the rook. If queen d6, that's a double attack, but actually after rook e3, don't forget there's a pin, g white is quite safe. So queen e6 played. Okay, there are lots of funny pins here. Rook d3, good move, unsettling that knight, knight f4. That knight is potentially dangerous, but watch what happens now. Rook d6, queen moves to a2, and rook takes h6. Those pawns looked mightily impressive out of the opening, but suddenly you can see it's very drafty behind the pawns, and that h6 pawn gets snapped off. And white is two pawns up. This is already extremely difficult. Queen b2 from Nakamura attacking this one, and this is an outright blunder. Vidit had enough time, I think, from memory, he had something like 10 minutes on the clock. And he found this crusher of a move, queen d7. So, of course, if rook takes knight, then the rook hangs. The queen is threatening mate on f7, supported by the knight. So, queen b3, defending this one. And here's the point. The queen bounces back to f5. So there's some nasty check here. The g5 pawn is hanging. 
I mean, this is absolutely catastrophic for Black. And at this point, yeah, Nakamura was pulling lots of faces and oh, he looked like he was in agony. There is no defence at all. Knight g6 played. And Rook takes g6 check. Final move of the game, Hikaru Nakamura resigned. Okay, why did he resign? Let's just go through this. Simple exchange sack. Check. If king at j8, then, well, let's snap off that g pawn, first of all. The king can't escape. And now, well, of course, it's possible to play this. That takes the queen and white with all these extra pawns. Well, that's a pretty easy win. But maybe even easier is just to bring this rook up. Rook e4 and mate here. There are many ways to win, but that's a pretty decent one. And finally, if king f8, knight d7 is checkmate. There we go. So, coming back to Nakamura's opening. Is it possible to play like this? It is, of course. If this is your taste, then please go for it. But be aware how weak these squares are and potentially h6 too, if something goes wrong. If something goes wrong, you're falling from a greater height. It basically just raises the stakes when you play a move like g5. And if it goes wrong, as it did here, you can see that black's position collapses. Just compare the two king positions. The black king, just a wreck, very drafty. Its cover has been blown. Compare it with white's. There we go. That's why it's very risky to play moves like h6 and g5. And very often I see moves like this played and they're simply a waste of time. Nakamura had a very specific plan to play like this, which is fair enough. But very often I see these moves and black just neglects development and that can be fatal. Right, so let's have a look at standings after round nine. So here we go. In the lead, we have Gukesh and Nipomnishi on five and a half points. Uh, Gukesh was pressing against Caruana today, didn't clinch it, a draw. Nepo had to defend quite, yeah, yeah very well actually, defending really well against Firuz Jar. So two draws. And then further down, we had Fabiano Caruana trying to bounce back, trying to stir things up against Abasov, but Abasov played pretty solidly and that one was a draw as well. So Gukesh, Nepo on five and a half, Pragnananda five, Nakamura, Vidit and Caruana on four and a half points. So it's still pretty much bunched together. It's completely wide open do join me tomorrow for round 10 where we have the big matchup we have the two leaders Yanni Pomnishi and Domaraja Gukesh facing off against each other don't miss it